Hello everyone, and we've made it to episode 8 of our App Builder creation video tutorial series. Thanks so much for joining us, and if you've missed any videos, do please go to our playlist on YouTube to catch up. This time I'm going to start with a little tidying up that will allow us to add more functionality to the editors that we're creating. But before I do that, I wanted to recap a couple of small changes made since the last video. So to do that, let's switch to our code editor and let me run through what has changed. So you might remember the color button that we defined earlier and it had the colored rectangle on one side and a label showing the hex value on the other. I changed that after our video to be an entry widget so that we could change the hex value and have it update automatically. To do that, I also needed to have an unchanged hook onto that entry widget. So we look up the color for the hex string and then we set the color on the theme and update our rectangle as before. As I mentioned at the time, we had tapped set up to respond anywhere on the widget. And if we move to editor uh, to an entry, that wasn't really going to work. So I also made a change that our rectangle would stop being just a rectangle. And I had to make that a se separate type I called it swatch, which is just a tappable rectangle, essentially. And that means that when we tap on the swatch, it will bring up the color dialog. But if we tap on the entry widget, it's just going to allow us to enter our new color. I also made small changes by passing the name of the color that we're editing in, which allows a better experience for somebody choosing the color. So I was able to set the title of our dialogue to choose the color with the name in there. So like choose foreground color or choose button color, which is a little bit more helpful. And lastly on the dialogue, we were using the basic color picker by just saying show color picker. I updated that by setting advanced on it. So I created the color picker using the new um, creation function and then set the advanced field on it and then showed it. So we get a more rich color picking experience, which I will show you in a moment. The other item in the work that was done last time that was a little untidy I wanted to come back to was calling update on each of the color picker buttons that we had defined. We had foreground and background update and then button. And I said at the time that this was going to get a bit out of hand. And so what I've done is I set up a little iterator. We go through the form objects and update them, just um, all of them in one pass. To make this possible, I defined a small updatable interface that just defined that update function, which our button already had. And so that way, if the form items support it, we will ask them to update. With that small change, it was much easier to see how we could have uh, more buttons in our user interface. And so I went ahead and I just added buttons for all of the colors and I put them in groupings under button, widgets, state, and other. So you can see how this is really added to the amount that can be edited. And I put that form into a scroll container uh, so that we're able to, uh, well, so that the window doesn't have to grow to accommodate all of that. So we can actually just run this now go run and I will pass it the name of our example project. So we're going to see the latest version of the editor. It looks basically the same, but when we open our editor, we can see lots of colors defined here. There is a scroll bar that we can drag down and this is showing all of the different colors in the standard theme and we can flick there to dark mode and see the equivalent colors. When we tap on one of these items here, this is the more advanced color picker, which allows us to expand and pick the color directly through this radial, the sliders, or by typing values in directly, including actually the hex value, which we can type here or we can type it back here. As you see, it just copied that value over. So that's all of the changes 
um, that were made since last time. If you want to follow along, you could do that at our GitHub repository. That's the Fission Tutorials project inside the Fine Labs organization. And so here you can see in the history, these changes were made after episode seven was committed. And that follows the pattern of a few previous items, just allowing me to tidy up a little bit in between episodes. But now let's get back to the focus of this video. We're going to be extending the capabilities of our editors. What I wanted to do was to start by tidying up the return type of our editors for URI function. I noted last week when we we're editing it that by extending the content canvas object to include a second one for our palette, it was going to get a little bit untidy over time. So I would like to start by working on this. We're going to be able to set up a new interface. I'll call this editor. And that's going to firstly define that an editor can have a content and a palette, but it will allow us to extend functionality. Um, and we'll see more of that later in this episode. So first of all, let me define that interface. So like I said, I'll call it editor. And it is a simple interface. And it's going to define two types. The first is content. And that's uh, returning a canvas object. And the second is palette. Also a canvas object. As you can see, this is really just wrapping up these two items here into an interface, which is a little shorter, but we'll see as we progress through how this is going to improve the situation substantially. So to make this uh, compile, we're going to need to update each of the places where we were previously returning a pair of plain canvas objects. So we'll just try and skip through a few of them here. Um, also, when we're returning nil-nil, we no longer need to do that. And then our matched template here needs to update. And then each of the uh, functions that created new editors is going to be impacted. So we'll update each of those. And when we were returning, we no longer need a nil palette, or, well, or a nil um, middle parameter anyway. We will update each of those. And we'll see that slowly these um, errors going away. Make text also is now only returning two parameters. There's a couple of compile errors, and we'll look at that in a moment. The last one is also this make GUI function that wants to return an editor as well, removing the extra nil return. And we have one item here to come back to. This is the equivalent of the compile errors here. We're returning simple canvas objects, but we're really, we need to be working with something a little bit richer. So let's define a very simple implementation of that interface. Um, well, let's just start with exactly that. Simple editor, and this is going to be a struct. And in here, we will just have our content and palette. In fact, let's just go content. There's a canvas object because that's all we're going to need right now. We need to implement the two methods. So func on simple editor, that returns content. That is pretty straightforward. Obviously we could just return the content. And similarly, we're going to need that um, function for palette. And in this case, we're going to return nil because our simple editors don't have a palette. So here, where we are trying to return just a canvas object, but we need uh, an editor, we can return a simple editor. And the content is that code object. And that's our compile error sorted. We'll use the same for our image um, preview editor type of object that's going to return the content is the image. And this Go um, code editor, uh, which is still mostly to do, is taking uh, the text editor and making a modification. 
and this code object is no longer an, ent an entry, it's now an editor. But we can just um, ask for the content uh, that's returning the interface type though, so we just need a quick cast to simple editor, which we know it is, and then we can access the content directly. And then just before, like before, we're saying it's an entry, and we want its text style to be monospace. So that has fixed all of the compilation errors for our basic, um, re, uh, for the basic editors. We need to do the same for our GUI editor. Now this one, of course, is going to have two items because we do want this palette to be returned. So we can try to use our simple editor again, and the content would be that um, uh, inner. I think that's the, that's correct. Um, we're replacing oh, content would be content, sorry. And then we want also to specify that the there should be a palette. So let's say that there is this palette. That is going to take away that compiler. But we have a new problem here because the simple editor doesn't have a palette. So that's easily done. We can make them one here and return it here. And that's going to continue to default to returning nil if we don't specify one. So that's going to work. And we can use that for our graphical editor at this stage. Now, if we go back um, to our main graphical uh, user interface setup code. This is expecting two things to be returned, and now we only have one. So we can just take that out, and we'll work out what the palette is. Uh, well, that is from our editor uh, return type. So we can say that um, palette is edit.palette, and then it's going to check for nil like it did before. Uh, the editor here is going to be slightly different as well because that's wanting the content to be placed in our user interface. And I think that is probably the tidy up completed. So if we run the same application again, then we should see the same behavior. We have our user interface, uh, we have the palette here, and if we open a text file, we have no new palette. Now, this obviously isn't matching the text file. But the last thing I remember um, mentioning that we should tidy up from the previous video was that palettes aren't being um, uh, set as the, the root of that container, they're just being appended. Uh, and so that's why if we don't have anything to add, then it is going to leave the old one visible. So we do need to do a little bit more work in our user interface setup code here. So inside this um, editor, what we're probably going to want to do is to say, uh, create a new function, um, which is going to set up the palette. So um, if we just set palette, and we could pass in that editor, I suppose. And that code is going to jump out. Let's pop that in here. Set palette, and that's taking in an editor that editor um, is up in the editor's package at the moment, but that, um, uh, yeah, that might work, that might work. Yeah, okay, cool. Not a problem at all. And we drop that code in here. So now it's essentially the same, but we've, we've factored it out a little. So we're going to want to modify um, the palette contents instead of just appending to it. So if we go back up to where it was created, this right, um, what previously right container is a new order uh, set to G palette. And we want to keep the right top, like it currently says settings, but over time that might become something else, but it's the header that we're going to want to leave in place. So we just want to add new items to it. So instead of appending, we're going to want to uh, set the objects um, completely. So we can capture what the current objects are. So um, items is 
Comic dot objects, and then we wanting to keep just the first one. So actually, we could uh, do I think that. So we keep the zeroth one and cut any other out. And then if the palette we have is not nil, then items is going to be appended with our new palette. And that's the equivalent of adding a new item to the end. And then g.palette.objects is going to be set to our items. And then we need to just quickly refresh um, to update with the changes that we have um, made to the internal data. So one quick check again, and we should be off to the races. This is our user interface palette as before. And when we jump to our text editor, that has gone away. Oh, well, that wasn't quite right because it didn't update when we switched to tabs. And this is why I factored it out into a separate function. We have set palette and where we're creating it here is when we're opening a file. But actually, sometimes we're switching to an open file instead. And that's when we need to work to add another column. So we have this set up here. Our content is the tab container, and we've already got some code that runs when a tab is selected. We're using this here to make sure that the different um, elements, in this case, the file tree and the tab bar are staying in sync. So we can make use of this for loop here. If we are matching an open tab, we have a, an item here, so we can then um, go ahead and, and make the change. So this is just extracting a URI so it could be used further down. We're actually interested in the child item. Uh, so then we would want to set the palette um, and we need the editor there. So ideally we would pass something in here but at the moment we don't have anything. We have a URI to a tab item. And that's what we're able to compare on here. Uh, but neither of those contains information about the editor type that we earlier set up. So we're going to also want to do a little something about that. So let's create a new type here that we can use as the value side of our tab, open tab map. So this type, let's call it, I suppose, a tab item, um, which is going to contain the editor that we have passed. Uh, so that's editor, it's dot editor. Oh, hmm. So editor, editor's editor. I think there's some naming to be revised here. We can come back to that, I suppose. And the tab, which is going to be of the um, container dot tab item. So that's what was originally being used. And instead we're going to move to a more mm, complete metadata, something that we can add to more over time when we want to look up the editors that are associated with tabs under the URI. So once again, we have some more um, refactoring work to do here. So each time we're iterating and we're trying to tap match a child item with a tab item being passed in, it is now child item dot tab. So we'll do that there and there. And a few more, I think. Uh, well, this is the child item dot editor. And um, that's why we've set this up. Um, but then a couple more mentions of the tab. Um, and the, ah yes, the initialization needs to be corrected. Open tabs, ah yeah. I'll come back to that in a moment with the um, child .tab. That's the, the changes to look up, but we need to actually make the change to set it up as well. So we need to set it to a new tab item. The editor is the um, editor that we got from this for URI function, and the tab is the item that was previously being set against this open tab. Everything looks good. So let's go one more time 
and we should be able to see that our editor is now refreshing the screen and keeping everything in sync as we change between the file types. Cool. Right, well that's that's definitely uh, step one. It has refactored things a little bit tidier. Some naming could be improved, but as you can see, we're now returning some, uh, some real uh, types. We can attach behavior to it. So let's look at doing just that. In our tab title here, we have the name of the file that we're editing, uh, and we're able to open these files and make changes. But at this time, that's all we can do. Um, it's not clear what we would do next. The files are just sitting here in, in the buffer, I suppose. And if we have lots of tabs open, it's going to get confusing which ones are maybe modified. So let's just have a look at how we could update the tab title to show when something has been modified. That way, we're attaching a little state to the editor type that we have just defined. So the easiest way to do this, because we're going to be looking at a piece of data that is um, edited by some of our code, it wants to be reflected in the user interface, we can use data binding, um, which the find package included just for these sorts of purposes. Um, so this essentially is a boolean flag to say if the item has been edited, or it is dirty, I suppose is another term, um, but edited, I think, should work great for us here. And that is a binding dot bool type. And the, oh, the import is wrong. We just fix it by adding v2 there. Um, maybe, well, maybe that import issue has been fixed and I need to update my editor, I, I don't know. Anyhow, so we've added that type um, function call to our editor definition. And so the compile errors that we're seeing are because none of our um, implementations actually include that functionality yet, which is actually just one place, this simple editor that we set up. So this wants to have an edited flag, which is a binding dot bool. And uh, we could put that as a requirement for the setup code. Um, but actually, I think I could just inline something here. So in the simple editor, um, because everybody's going to be getting access to that state um, through this function um, edited, which is, again, returning binding.bool, what I could do is to say if um, our instance is nil, then, then we can set it up. So we will just um, make that um, binding.new bool. And that's going to default to the zero value or false in this case, and then um, return it. So now our editor very simply has got a piece of state added to it that uh, says whether or not the file has been edited. We're not doing anything with it yet, but let's go ahead and do so. The quickest way, I suppose, to test this is going to be with our text and um, entry-based text editor. So in here, simplest thing is just to say on changed. So any time that our widget has changed, um, actually we don't really, we don't mind uh, what it has changed to, so we can ignore the input parameter. Um, excuse me, we set it to a function that takes a string that we would then ignore. But all we need to do is to set the um, binding to true. To do that, we're going to need this editor. That's the type that's going to hold it for us. So we'll set it up and return it there. And in between, We'll take this little bit of code and paste it in here. So anytime our entry changes, then we will um, get the um, oh goodness me, that's got two parameters there. One of them needs to go on the exit there. So edit dot um, uh, edited. 
and we'll use this function to make sure it's initialized, set it to true. So we now are saying, yep, our code has been edited. That's one half of the equation. The other half is going to be in our user interface setup code. So we are back where we create a new tab. We already updated it uh, you know, to pass more information here so we could keep metadata about what was going on. But we're also going to want them to listen to the edited state on, on this type here. And that's going to impact the title of the tab item. So I think we have everything we need here. So the editor, which has an edited Boolean binding, is then available to us to um, read um, and then uh, reflect the state of. So let's just reference this. Edited or dirty to reflect. <laughs> Slightly different naming makes it a little bit cleaner, I suppose, when we're juggling things. So now we can say uh, add a listener to that um, Boolean binding. So anytime it changes, we're going to be informed. And what we pass in there is a new a data listener of any type. But in this case, there's a shorthand, um, which is to simply set up an empty function. Using the new data listener, we can pass it in directly instead of having to create um, new types or, or anything more complex than this. So we will then um, get the get the state. Um, is dirty uh, is dirty dot get, and actually that can return an error. In um, in binding, these things can chain up. All sorts of reasons could exist for having an error, but we know it's a simple boolean check. It's not going to error in this case. So we can just um, check if if that is. Um, actually marked as a dirty file. So if that is true, then what I'm going to do is um, update the tab item text to be, um, well, the name plus um, an asterisk, I think is, is commonly done. Uh, if it isn't edited, then the item text is just the name, like we set up before. It might feel like that return to the original state isn't needed, um, but of course this is going to be called both when something becomes marked as dirty and when it becomes unmarked, no longer edited, like when it's saved, for example. Uh, now we've just updated the metadata for tab. Um, ideally then you would take that tab item and refresh it. I don't think that is currently supported. So instead, um, we will update the um, tab container, which will definitely catch that change. Um, and well, more. Usually, best idea to refresh the smallest scope possible so the GPU or the CPU has got the least amount of work to do. Uh, but in this case, that's just a metadata um, piece of information that's passed in. So we need to refresh the widget that it is passed in to. Okay, uh, so we're marking star on something that has been edited. Well, okay, let's let's see how that gets on. We'll go open our project, open a text file, and say hi. And there we go. The asterisk has been appended to our file to show that it's modified. But really, well, we would like something better than that. I now it's. I know it's been modified now, and I'd, I'd like to save it, honestly. Well, let's do that as well. I think we could probably assume that all open editors want to be able to support saving. Uh, we may find an instance in the case where they're perhaps read-only, um, but for now, we'll assume that um, they can all be saved. Uh, yeah, save function could probably return an error, so that's likely the best thing to do. And the main uh, function of save is going to be to obviously write the file out to disk and then to mark the binding. 
as not edited anymore. So if we go to um, the simple editor that we created before, all of these complaints are saying, no, there's no save function. So we'll go and add that. In theory, you know, editing is simple. We just make this uh, method, call it save, and it returns a possible error. And now those compile errors go away. Um, we can return no error and everything's great. But of course, nothing has actually happened when we saved. So how are we going to go about saving? Um, okay, well, let's come back to this in a moment and let's follow through with the usage of the binding and update that. So we would want to access the edited binding and set it to false because we are no longer looking at an edited file, assuming that the save completed, of course, and we will come back to that in a moment. What, um, what else would we do? Well, I mean, actually that's because we're not saving the file yet. Um, <clears throat> that's all that's needed, but we do have to trigger it somehow. So let's go back out to our user interface again and see our menu setup. So there's a file menu that we created here um, before. Uh, just skip through a few places where the word file is used. And that is maybe a little further. Here we go. Ah, it was in the function make menu. Probably could have remembered that. And we have one item here, open project, which we demonstrated many videos ago to open a project when you already have um, something else in front of you. So let's open um, a new, actually we don't need a new menu. We could just add this one to the end. Let's just group it slightly um, by putting a new menu item separator in between them. And then add the new menu item um, for save. So we'll call it save and the little function in line here for now just while we're um, prototyping this out, I suppose. How are we going to save? Okay, um, so we need to know what editor we have, which would be from our tab. So that would be from the content that has the um, selected tab, that selected function. So um, current is, that's the current tab. But actually, we need the editor for that tab. So let's see. Um, there's a few places where we iterate through open tabs. Um, and we look to see if, um, if our current one uh, matches the tab that we're looking for. Let's just have a look. Wow, this would be an example here. Let's cheat a little bit and pop that in. So the current editor is going to be in the case where those match. Um, if the child tab matches current, um, ah, yeah, current is fine. We don't need the URI, we just need the editor, which is the child here. So if it's not the same, we'll continue on, which means that if they are the same, we can just code save. Um, ah, thank you. Yes, that was our tab item. The editor was a child of it, and that has save on it there. Now, save can return an error, and of course, we should always check our errors. If the error um, was not nil, then we need to handle it. In this case, we've, we've called in from a menu item. The user has specifically requested an action. We don't want to silently fail. Um, let's use that um, error dialog again. Um, Dialogs. Dot. Sh uh, dialog. Sorry. Dot. Show. Error. There we go. We pass it the error that occurred, and the parent window, um, which I think was g. Dot. Win. So if there was a save error, we then would show that. Um, and there we go. That's it. We saved the file that matched. Um, so potentially, actually, it's going to be a little quicker if we then break because we know there's no not going to be any other open tabs that match. So we run our example code again, we go to our text editor, take out that tab, um, and we say hi. 
this is edited, we go to our file menu and save. And it has marked the file as saved. Now we obviously know that there was no file written just yet, um, but it does show that the binding um, aspect of that is working. So how do we go about actually making the save? So we could make, um, well, obviously we need a bit of code to write a file back out. We could make all sorts of um, complex types that represent each of our different editors. But I think, um, let, sorry, we're looking at the text editor at the moment, aren't we? Um, we're just using this simple editor here. And it would be good to not have to make lots of new types. So I think what we could do is have another field in here um, called save, and that is a function returning an error. So if that has been set, we can, um, we can use it. So here we say uh, during save, instead of, well, we don't do anything yet. Um, if uh, we have a save, uh, function defined. Actually, if we don't, if it's nil, um, we're just going to return. There's nothing we can do and uh, we can't say it's not saved um, because, sorry, we, we can't say it's no longer edited um, because it is still in the dirty state. We haven't been able to make anything happen with the editing. Um, otherwise, then we're going to be able to say, um, well, call the save function and there'll be potentially an error returned. And if um, that is uh, nil, yeah, if there was no error, then it is safe to mark this as no longer edited. And then we'll return whatever error there was. So it does actually cascade up the way. So in this manner, we're calling whatever built-in save function we have. Um, if it doesn't error, we set it to not edited anymore. If it does error, we'll send that error back out and the user interface will report that to our user and the file will still be marked as edited. Um, but to actually write something, we're going to need to figure out how to write a file. Our new simple editor here um, is going to want a function. Oh, let's not inline that actually, it might be a little more complex. So. Um, the save function could be defined. Instead, uh, we have make text. Let's just uh, make a new function save text for now. As you can see, over time, it may indeed be desirable to, <laughs> to make these individual types and associate behavior with them. Um, but it's easier to evaluate these things if you just make the functions one at a time, see how they group together, and then and then add new types. The simple editor could be set as a text editor, a GUI editor, an image editor, and it might over time. But for now, the functionality is really consistent enough. So to be able to save the text, we can't actually just have an empty text um, save function with an error because we don't know anything about what we're doing. <laughs> Unfortunately true. We're going to want a URI um, to write the data out to and we're going to want the content to write as well. So this save text isn't going to match the expectations for the save function. So we make a little um, shim or wedge here function that is going to wrap the save text and call it with the parameters needed because we do actually have those parameters here. The U is the URI and the text content is um, the, well, the text content of the code widget. And then we want to return whatever error and, oh yes, the function um, could return that error. So that's all wired together. We've made that simple function wrapper that calls save text passing in the context we have. Again, it's a, a new function, but it's in line and it's saving us to finding new types. So hopefully that's beneficial. To make this um, write out, we're going to use the um, storage package again. In fact, it's kind of the mirror 
of what we've got going on here. So we're going to open a storage writer, handle the error, and defer if it works. I'll just copy those. Let's not copy the read code though. So the R is a W. We're looking for a writer this time. And actually it's not safe to assume that this is going to go as planned because we might be opening a read-only file. We might be editing a file that's, that's not even available anymore. So if there was an error, then we're going to return that and we're not going to assume that just because we could read it, we can write it later. So there we go. We're going to then close this write closer, which is what writer is returning, um, if it was successful. And then we are going to want to write all of the data out, um, write string into the writer. And we're using the string passed into the function. And we don't really care how many um, bytes were written, I don't think. So we'll just check for the error. And um, in fact, I think we could even return that error. Um, okay, what did I miss here? Um, I will write string. Ah, the error is not a new variable. Okay, simple enough. So we've opened a writer to the URI. Um, we have written the string to it and returned any errors that occurred, and that will be closed after completion. It kind of feels like that's a little bit too simple, but hey, let's let's have a look, I suppose. So we have this um, file here, opens this uh, globe.mod. Um, Let's, let's just take that tab out, but just for ease of checking. And we'll call this example two. Maybe actually break that at the moment. And we'll save it. And well, let's just exit the project and use the brute force approach of checking whether the file wrote. And it did. How fantastic is that? And we can save it again. Obviously, we can extend the ability of saying, how do you save? And the context of how do you save the user interface is going to be using the same library that we use to parse it. How do you save a theme is a topic for a further conversation. So we'll come back to that later. However, this is not just the slickest user experience to go up to the menu and say save. If we're putting more text here, we're probably going to want to just save it um, with command S but that's not going to work too well at all. And also, goodness me, I tried to press new line there, um, the enter button, and it wasn't working. So that's, uh, that's not too fantastic. What happened, I think, is that I forgot to say, this is actually a new, a multi-line. Yeah, look at that. That actually made use of an open bug that a single line entry can have multiple lines if you give it space and push multiple line content into it. But now it is a multi-line, so we can use the enter or return key to create a new line. But also we want to have a shortcut for the saving. Well, there's two places at least that that would be useful. The menu for start is going to be a good place to do. So where we set up the file menu, save. This menu item here is um, just a basic menu item, but if we take that out, um, save is defined as a new menu item. I'll pass it in here like before. Um, oh, I think I misplaced a bracket there. Save, yeah. Then we can define the um, shortcut here on the save menu item. Um, and that is going to be uh, a new, well, I don't think save is built into find, so we'll need to define a new custom shortcut. That's a type. Um, so obviously shortcut, sorry, is a type in the find package. And we can go and explore exactly what that is. Um, it's pretty straightforward and there's various different um, types. There's a paste, cut, copy, standard things. 
So what we want to make use of is um, we want a new keyboard shortcut created here. And lots of things can implement that. They're standard types. Um, we can make a custom type, sorry. But actually, um, there's a, a new um, custom custom shortcut, but it's not in the main fine package because keyboard shortcuts are seen as a, a desktop thing, I suppose. Uh, we use the desktop package um, to create a new custom uh, shortcut. Uh, let me see if I, that did import correctly. Uh, new, um, why is that not? Oh, it doesn't have a it doesn't have a constructor function. Oops. So we have a custom shortcut type here that allows us to say what's the name of the shortcut. Uh, sorry, what's the key for the shortcut and what modifier does it use? So the um, key name, uh, sorry, key name is the S key for save, and the modifier that actually is a tricky one because on a Mac where I am, we want to use the command key, um, but on Windows, it's a control. This is quite a common setup. So actually, Fine has defined um, the uh, shortcut default modifier. Oh, that's a, a bit of a mouthful, sorry, but the key modifier, shortcut default. And that, as you can see from the documentation, is going to use control or command depending on the system that you're on. Um, so where it's a standard kind of shortcut key, that's probably going to be the right approach. And this um, custom shortcut uh, is just defining exactly that. It's the default modifier for the key S. Um, and although that won't um, make a lot of difference in our code, it's going to put this key binding onto the save menu here. Uh, cool, that's one approach. Um, also, we probably want it in our editor as well. So where we created our new entry here, we're going to want to register a shortcut. But the entry doesn't allow us to insert new types of shortcuts into it. Um, this function here is the result of a shortcut being typed so the entry can hear about it, but it doesn't allow us to add more items. So we're kind of, it feels a little bit stuck. But actually what we can do is we can create a new entry that is a, a multi-line entry, but in addition understands our uh, save requirements and other sh shortcuts that we want to add in the future. So this is going to be our um, extended widget for text and save. Rather than having another new type in that same file, it feels time to open a new file for the text editors. Let's go there. Um, it's still the same package. Um, from our editors, we can take um, save text and make text. We can take them out of here and just pop them in this file instead. And in here, we're going to define our um, text editor, um, our text entry, code entry type. And that's a, a struct, and it's going to extend um, the entry. Um, we don't say it's a pointer to entry because we are going to encapsulate all of entry ourselves. And that is going to have a um, ability to call back the uh, save. So we're probably going to want a, a save function. Much like our um, previous uh, simple editor did. There's probably a little overlap here, but I think they, they still keep a separate uh, separation. The code entry here is just a widget. Um, so we'll make a, a helper function just to match the new multi-line entry here, um, new code entry widget. Um, this is going to take a parameter which is the save function and return uh, code entry. 
actually, I mean, it could return an entry widget, but that's okay. So we set up our new um, return type code entry is what we're building. And much like when we were building a custom widget in a previous episode, we need to call extend um, extend base widget passing in itself. And then we can return C. Uh, almost missed that the save needs to be set to the function that we're passing in. And the entry that is being extended needs to be set to multi-line. So multi line in strange. Okay, I think we're missing an input. Ah, there we go. All sorts of things changing now. The input's got a bit messed up. Let's just fix them again. Save, and we should get helpful suggestions from the editor. Multi line is true. There we go. So it's a multi line entry that we have extended. And the reason that we wanted to do this was to respond to the save keyboard shortcut. So in our um, code entry, we want to respond to typed shortcut. And that is going to take a fine shortcut as a parameter, I believe. Um, let's just um, double check. So the entry Let's compare to new multi-line entry typed shortcut. Yeah, it takes a shortcut parameter there. So we're going to get this before our um, wrapped entry. Um, so if we don't do anything with it, we really should uh, remember to call back onto the parent one there. Um, for Otherwise we would break, select all, copy, cut, paste, all those things. So what we can do, uh, however, is then switch on the shortcut um, name. Uh, yep. And ooh, actually, let's not switch on the name. That's, that, that's going to be a bit of string comparison and not so great. Let's check to see if it is of the same type of shortcut that we were setting up before. This custom shortcut. So is it a custom shortcut? Oh, text. Okay, custom shortcut is shortcut dot um, find our custom. Oh no, it was desktop here. Custom shortcut. So if it is a custom shortcut, um, then uh, if the modifier is the default, um, and the key, key name is something like key s. I was about to type out switches earlier, and we could we could do that, um, but for now we're just handling one. And if all of that works out, then we're going to want to call our save. Um, oh, I've overloaded C now. Sorry about this. Call that sh for custom shortcut. Get the key name and then C dot save is going to be called. And um, if oh, I think I've got these the wrong way around. The shortcut and the OK parameter. Yeah, OK, perfect. That sorted that all out. And here we'll return because we don't want to cascade down just in case there was a default implementation for that keyboard shortcut. Um, that, I think that all looks okay. So then we go to our editors here and see what the problems are. Oh, just imports, I think. Save the file and we're good. Okay, I think that should be everything. We've just not. Oh goodness, yes, we've not actually used this in our new tech. We're still using the new multi-line entry. We want to do the new code entry, which has a save function. Oh, well, we can reuse this code from here um, and set that up. So save is that function. 
code dot text. We need the text from the code entry, and the code entry is not set up, so we we'll use that old trick of um, code entry is here. Um, call is going to be called code, and then we'll assign it later, passing in the save function. Okay. Yep. And that should mean that the errors have gone away. Yes, uh, or the warnings rather. We're, we're now using all of the code. So let's go and uh, run the project, open this file, um, check the new line works. Yes, it does. Um, some text and command S and the file has saved. Excellent. Let's just take that back out. And command A is still selecting all. So we haven't broken the shortcut functionality of the existing entry that we extended. Okay, there we have it. Much smarter editors now. Um, then you can see how that this is going to make it easier for more complete editors to be dropped in. Uh, we could have a markdown editor or we could just add more functionality to the image and um, graphical preview, um, uh, sorry, the graphical editing uh, widgets um, as full editors as well. And we could just, yeah, drop them in much more easily now than we could before. Uh, don't forget please to subscribe to this channel uh, for updates. You'll get a reminder uh, when our next video about preferences and project metadata goes live. If you're interested in the project and you would like to be um, helpful in determining what functionality we build out and how to prioritize, then you can do so. If you head in your browser to fission.app, um, you'll see this screen and you can now tap this help prioritize button and with just a couple of minutes of your time you can help us figure out which bits of functionality are going to be the most beneficial. So thanks in advance for doing that and for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your week and we'll see you back here again very soon.